The most powerful aspect of the Nazi propaganda machine was the mass meeting. Hitler, the master of the crowd, entered along an avenue through the crowd, a via triumphalis of living bodies, as Goebbels described it. Oscar Turner, a last roll call of the dead was held in front of the temples of honor. Present, chanted the crowd, a macabre pastiche of the Stations of the Cross. The appropriation of the Christian liturgy was a recurrent Nazi device. A complex visual arrangement of uniforms and group formations was meticulously choreographed. A fascination with geometry, with structured patterns, People formed groups as though molded by an invisible will. A new communal body language was created which synchronized thousands moving to the same beat. Forming sculptures, standing to attention, raising arms to give the party salute, a sinister ballet, a massive celebration which lulled the brain and led to a kind of ecstasy. Then there followed Hitler's lonely ascent to a position of solitary splendor overlooking a sea of red flags, isolated as a god. These rallies were Hitler's Gesamtkunstwerk. In them, he created his ultimate stage productions. Trost also built Munich's new gallery it was praised as a temple of German art, one of the monuments of a new age. The temple form obviously recalled the prestige of a culture which reached back to antiquity. The neoclassical structure was a heavier version of Schinkel's old museum in Berlin, built in the 19th century. Hitler wrote, these works of ours shall also be eternal. Magnificent evidence of civilization in granite and marble. These buildings of ours should not be treated as contemporary, nor of the year 2000, but instead, like the cathedrals of our past, they shall stretch into the millennia to come. So, Nuremberg, until its destruction, was one of the best preserved medieval cities in Germany. Its appeal to Hitler's idea of patriotism was obvious. It was here that he built the giant stadiums, the architectural framework for his mass meetings. A huge area of 30 square kilometers, the size of a small town, was planned by Trost. On his death, it was handed over to Albert Speer. It was to be the largest complex of its kind in the world. A few figures sufficed to give an idea of the size of this megalomaniac undertaking. The Zeppelin field had an arena for 240,000 spectators. The March field was supposed to hold 500,000 visitors. The buildings became crowd containers, stages for the great events, and the people were part of the architecture, like the sculptures, flagpoles, the grandstands, and the braziers. The massive architecture inflated the myth of the Führer into gigantic proportions. The huge Congress Hall built by the architect Ludwig Ruff was never finished. The architecture recalls that of the Colosseum, giving it a borrowed sense of permanence. Words like austerity, sobriety, Nordic were the favorite words used to describe these new buildings. They were securing Hitler's power for all time.
Inside, a huge theatre and assembly hall were planned with the latest technology in lighting and heating. In the giant roof, a huge skylight was to open to the sky. Each of the major German cities was to have a giant arena for mass assemblies. Hitler commissioned the architect Werner Marsch to build a sports stadium in Berlin with a capacity of 100,000. As in Nuremberg, it was more than a mere sports arena. It was a ritual assembly. Built in German stone, quarried from all over the country, it was another expression of a communal effort. It was Hitler's idea to decorate all parts of the stadium with the works of his favorite sculptors, Wackele, Breker, Torak, and Kolbe. Their work reinforced the pervasive political message of the place. Ideals and signposts, they extolled the virtues of the German race, determination, health, and heroism. The Olympic Games of 1936 were a suitable occasion to parade this new architecture and sculpture. Hitler opened the Games in front of an impressed international crowd. A choir sang the Olympic hymn, especially composed by Germany's most prestigious and famous composer, Richard Strauss. And many, not just in Germany, were struck by the displays of vitality and culture. In 1938, Hitler commissioned Albert Speer to build a new chancellery. Contemporary critics praised its austerity, its German character, its imposing Prussian style. The gewaltige Bau der neuen Reichskanzlei dient auch dem großen repräsentativen Empfängen der Regierung. Der erste Staatsakt in diesem Hause war der Neujahrsempfang der ausländischen Diplomaten durch den Führer Großdeutschlands. The imposing building of the new chancellery is to be used for official receptions. For its inauguration, the Führer of the Greater German Reich receives foreign diplomats, the Hungarian ambassador, the ambassador of Japan. The Italian ambassador. Before entering Hitler's chancellery, one drove into a great well-like courtyard to be used for parades. The entrance was flanked by huge columns and was crowned by an eagle and swastika. On either side stood two large statues by Arno Breker, the party and the army, guardians of the chancellery and of the whole nation. In contrast to the stark exterior, was the flamboyant and theatrical interior, a reflection of the nouveau riche taste of the Nazi elite. Elaborate window dressing borrowed from a feudal society. The interiors of official buildings were of calculated splendor, designed to stun the visitor and to force him into subservience. Everything, the size of the rooms, the large staircases, the giant decorations, the chandeliers, proclaimed that here people of a superior rank lived and worked. In the Führer's office, noble materials provide the serene but forceful color scheme which he loves for his working environment. Great thoughts are born here, a place for decisive conversations. Even administration buildings had to express the ideology of the regime. Its architectural order was the expression of a disciplined nation. Little produced in those years had any feeling of joy or of spontaneity. Like Hitler's speeches, his architecture was inflated, repetitious, banal. The architects used the language of classicism but little was left of the measured design of the great architects of the 19th century. Most of the architecture of the Third Reich has no sense of scale. The public 
public buildings became more and more overbearing. They dwarfed the people and forced them into submission. This is the Academy of the National Socialist German Workers' Party in Bavaria. It was never built, but it gives an idea of the shape of things to come. These massive buildings were designed by Hermann Giesler. Their brutality has seldom been matched. They inspired fear and fascination and continue to do so. As he became more powerful, Hitler lost interest in individual buildings. He developed a taste for things on a much larger scale. While the German cities sank into ruins one by one, Hitler dreamed up larger and larger building schemes. It was one of the many contradictions, an urge to build and to destroy at the same time. Hitler loved Rome and Paris but Berlin was to outshine both in size and splendor. Early one morning, shortly after the occupation of France, in the company of his favorites, the sculptor Arno Brecker and the architects Albert Speer and Hermann Giesler, he drove through the deserted streets of the French capital, the conqueror's flying visit. It inspired his plans for the new German capital. 19th century city was to be destroyed and replaced by a new one, a massive project with a 39-kilometer highway at its core. The east-west highway, which the shaping hand of our Führer has cut through the chaotic development of the old city, is an expression of his far-sighted genius. There was no place for modesty in this regime. The main avenue, flanked by great official buildings, was to create the imperial perspectives worthy of a world power. It ended in a triumphal arch. Hitler spent hours gazing entranced at the models Speer had made for him. They stood floodlit in the Reich Chancellery. There, Hitler indulged his fantasies as the great patron of an architecture which would outdo Babylon and Luxor. His excessive self-love meant he had to outdo the rest of history. But like so many of Hitler's dreams, these great plans remained on the drawing board. A gigantic building program will change the face of Berlin. It is the result of the National Socialists' determination. On the facades of these buildings which surround the great circus, one can read the impressive clarity and the creative spirit which will be the hallmark of the architecture of the Third Reich. There was to be a giant hall for 200,000 people, based like the triumphal arch on Hitler's early drawings. It was crowned by the eagle of the Reich holding a swastika. The Nazi's main sculptor, Arno Brecker, was asked to design a fountain 126 meters in diameter with a figure of Apollo six meters high. Goebbels wrote, Berlin will become the capital in absolute control of Europe or even of the world.